Hey guys, what's up? This is Chad Haig from Southern India. I wanted to do a series of videos on Slavoj Žižek's um, deeply underrated book, The Indivisible Remainder on Shelling and Related Matters. This video will cover chapter one, Shelling in Itself. And I think that this is a really interesting book among Žižek's vast body of work, because in a certain sense, every Zizek book is about Hegel. Every Zizek book is about psychoanalysis. But it's very rare for Zizek to devote an entire book to a thinker other than like those, those two concerns. And this is a whole book on Schelling, which gives a very valuable glimpse into how Zizek is um, sort of latching onto German idealism in a context in the late 80s and during the 1990s, when the academic fad was largely deconstruction, post-structuralism, and Foucault. And his decision to latch on to German idealism, obviously you, gain, you get a lot from reading his many meditations on Hegel. And yet this book will present some very um, interesting thoughts he has on like Schelling and Fichte and of course Hegel as well. So I definitely recommend The Indivisible Remainder. I think one of the uh, less read books within his body of work, certainly less read than say Sublime Ob Object of Ideology or Ticklish Subject, but a really good book. So once again, this is his 1996 book on Schelling. It's one of actually the most difficult books that he has written. There's a, there's a very dense level of analysis that he has, especially within the first chapter. I'll be covering in this video and his understanding of uh, German idealisms, um, the way that it's usually approached is something that he's largely going to reverse in this analysis and that he begins by reversing the standard, you know, radical political question, which is how to undermine the established order by instead asking, how does an order emerge out of disorder in the first place? And further, what inconsistencies allow order to maintain itself anyway? And this is precisely the question that interested Schelling. Of course, speaking about Schelling and politics will inevitably sound kind of controversial because one would normally think that a philosophy of the absolute, which is what German idealism is, will necessarily lead to totalitarian politics. In fact, Judith Butler recounts when she was like 12 years old, she, she would ask her teachers, like, did German idealism cause fascism? This is something on her mind thinking about, you know, a philosophy of the absolute obviously has only that political route. But Schelling actually showed that contact with the absolute will provide the individual with the ability to resist a state power, which if you follow Schelling's system, will actually be revealed to be relativized into contingency. Therefore, the standard formula to understand Hegel is something of an absolute idealist pan-logicism, um, obviously coming from the Greek words pan for all and lo logos for like reason, a full idealist rationalization is how Hegel might be understood. And of course, Schelling's standard formula is to instead focus on a gap, okay? And to be the first philosopher to really think about finitude even you know, before Heidegger took that theme up, um, is has to be understood within the context that for Schelling, there is this type of mediation or idealization, but there's a grund in the background, which is never fully mediated or sublated. Therefore, in chapter one, which will be the subject of this video, Schelling in itself, the orgasm of forces, um, he'll, uh, he'll show that German idealism is often thought of as the problem of a beginning. And obviously a work like Phenomenology of Spirit by Hegel, it deals with, um, at the beginning, you know, since uh, sense certainty being a beginning of sorts with regard to thinking of the forms of consciousness. And um, certainly Schelling is interested in the problem of the beginning as well. But he's interested in actually going back to before the beginning. And what Schelling claims you'll find if you go back to before the beginning is that you'll find the rotary motion of the drives. This is a little bit like Freud, actually. And he says that this is uh, the drives have a vicious cycle that is only broken by some primordial act of decision. But of course, if it's only broken by an act of decision, that decision itself as an act is revealed to be, um, and so it says relativized to absolute contingency. So before the world, you get the chaotic psychic universe of blind drives. The beginning is therefore an act of repression that casts these drives back into the eternal past. But with this beginning, 
the past and the present become explicitly differentiated in that the closed rotary motion of drive is replaced by the open trajectory of progress. This is where historical time begins to unfold. Again. And the beginning can also be considered as a phenomenalization in which God appears to himself through a type of self-disclosure. That's what the beginning is. Okay? Yet even the ground of drives is something that you can, in a certain sense, go beyond in that even um, they are still preceded by some unfathomable unfathom X. Prior to Grund, you have Ungrund. And the abyss of freedom is one which, because of its status as Ungrund, is one in which you have a type of willing, but this is a willing which wills nothing. And man is unique among beings in that only he can have contact with this type of freedom. Therefore, Schelling is going to actually differ from even another German idealist figure like um, Fichte, in that um, because man alone has contact with this abyss, man actually um, has in himself a principle from before the beginning of times. In other words, we have co-knowledge of creation. This is the identity between human freedom and the primordial abyss. So he's actually going to differ from Fichte in that Schelling will speak of a self-positing act by which man creates himself. But this is not as the conscious eye of Fichte, but rather as like the unconscious more similar to Freud. He therefore avoids defining freedom as consciousness. He doesn't do the Sartrean thing, in other words, of saying that it's phenomenological consciousness, which is this type of, of you know, element which has to be free because it's not like other you know, mundane objects. That's the Sartrean position, kind of like the Fichtean position, um, opposing the dogmatism of the thing in itself. But that's not what Schelling thinks is important. Um, rather, for Schelling, it's the split which is important in that man predestined himself unconsciously, okay? But within time, his own freedom will actually appear to be its opposite. It will appear to be fatalist necessity. Therefore, there's an interplay between temporal becoming and eternal being or freedom, which gets lost if you simply reduce everything to the formula of freedom equals consciousness. And let me close this window. There's the noisy streets of India. I'll be disturbing the video. Okay, so um, once again, freedom is not so much the elucidation of consciousness as it is the suspension of ground in which you have a moment of eternity within time, okay? Therefore, Schelling's view on freedom is going to be different because man he considers to be unique among all the other beings in that other things simply are what they are. And their only relation to possibility is to actualize it. So, you know, other beings, they have a relation more to potentiality in the, uh, the, uh, the Aristotelian sense, and they can actualize that. But man differs by relating to possibility as such due to being linked with the absolute. And let me close the other window. There's a huge truck making a bunch of noise. Welcome to India, the noisiest, one of the noisier countries in the world. Anyway, um, so um, other things simply are what they are. Their only relation to possibility is more like potentiality, which is actualized. Man differs by being able to relate to possibility as such. And this is due to being linked with the absolute. Freedom, therefore, is the repetition of the act of the absolute. Okay? And God's eternal act of decision is not, however, what comes first. Prior to this, God has to contract being. And this contraction of being is where you have the positing of ground. Prior to the contraction, we have the nothing, which enjoys its non-being, as I mentioned on the last slide. So we have a problem here, because the will to contract versus the will to expand shows that potential and actual are really the same thing in two different modes. <clears throat> you have, excuse me, the pure potentiality of a, pu of a primordial freedom which wants nothing. 
This is kind of the potential side, right? Then you have the will which wants this nothing and will annihilate positive content. This is a type of pure contraction or divine madness, okay? Um, where you have instead of one accepting, right? So yet God actually suffers from anxiety in that he can neither withdraw into closure nor open up to alterity. So there's something of a deadlock here, uh, which is uh, going to be very important for any discussion, of course, the concept of freedom. So this antagonism is not accidental and it's not occasional. All reality actually has it. We only experience what looks like smooth reality because a balance between the two is maintained. It's kind of like a film, which is neither too fast nor too slow. If it's too fast or too slow, it'll lose its reality effect. It will no longer look like something that um, has the character of, uh, of the flow of reality. It'll, it'll be revealed to be the artificial film that it is. It's kind of like that. So likewise, eternity does not fall into time. Time is the result of an ascent to break the vicious cycle of the rotary drive's pulsation in order to begin the linear temporal succession, okay? And therefore, um, what is really unconscious is the act by which the drives were combined into the unity of a self. This is the act when I chose myself. And the passage from pure freedom to a subject who is free is a big deal that we'll return to in greater detail later, okay? So um, the interesting thing here is that Jung's theory of projecting the shadow actually kind of misses the point that there is only a me insofar as the abject is posited. It's not that you have a you and then because of something you won't acknowledge that you really hate about yourself, then you cast, you, you project the shadow and explicitly posit the abject, which is Jung's theory basically. Rather for showing, um, God distantiates from himself the ground of his existence, which, which is ejected away as the primordial contraction. But of course, there's only a me insofar as you have the abject as posited that way. Therefore, you have to talk about the two contractions for Zizek's, uh, for Zizek's understanding of showing, okay? And that is that the first contraction in his own word kind of expels shit to purify the essence. But at this level, contraction, understood this way, leaves contraction and expansion unresolved. Okay, the conflict I mentioned a bit earlier. The second contraction is going to differ from that in that the word is going to articulate the essence to the outside. But the contraction of the subject outside himself in the external sign is going to finally resolve the dispute that was left unresolved in the first contraction. And yet this will come at the cost of alienation because the word articulates the essence to the outside, the self will become exteriorized to itself. Still somehow this representation in the word is never fully adequate. The mystery remains, however, what exactly is the indivisible remainder, as the title of the book notes, which resists this reflective idealization? Is it just the external thing in itself, as Fichte or Kant would say? Or is it just the madness of the founding gesture of idealization itself? And let me just make sure that this is working. Thing in itself, as Fichte or Kant would say. Okay, it looks like it's still working. Okay, so, um, there is also, however, an intermediary stage between drive and word, and this is the level of the ideas. Before willing temptation, for example, a temptation is something like an idea because it's neither mine nor is it somebody else's. Ideas are therefore not yet actual, but are more like timeless pseudo-existences. And therefore, evil has to be reconsidered along these lines because above all, Schelling resists the traditional view that evil is just the privation of good. He shows actually that when you're dealing with finitude in the system, finitude is evil. Evil is due to the split in the absolute between God and his ground of existence. Evil is not therefore due to um, man's imperfection, rather his perfection over against other beings due to a split in God himself. Therefore, evil is when a finite creature rejoins the infinite. Man as finite and yet free is how you get evil. Evil is kind of like a short circuit between particular and universal. In that Zizek's own example of a particular political agent who claims to represent the universal nation, 
or uh, it or to um, have his words directly manifest the words of the big other, as he can say himself, um, that's evil. Because that is the type of short circuit to who in particular in universal lay mentions. Therefore, a contrary to expectation, evil is not a deficiency of spirit, which will be overcome through greater spiritualization. Evil is actually more spiritual than the good. Therefore, my self-consciousness is always decentered as a place where the transcendent absolute becomes aware of itself. And yet I can't understand it because it is transcendent. Therefore, you have to talk about the three levels of freedom. Um, there's the first lowest level of freedom in which you merely decide between two options after weighing the pros and cons. And he says that if this was the only level of freedom that you had, um, you would be unable to make a decision if there were no difference between the two. If you were presented with two meals exactly the same, you would starve to death if this was the only level of freedom. The second level, a bit higher, is the groundless decision, which is not based on rational, positive reasons, but is rather pursued even if the outcome is going to be harmful to you. Okay? And that certainly is higher. But the highest goes even beyond that. This is where the self is submerged in the primordial abyss of the absolute. And this is the primordial will, once again, which wills nothing. Therefore, he's going to argue, controversially, a shelling is something like the first materialist of subjectivity. The traditional view of materialism might be that the object is some dense material being, which the subject differs from by having the transparent light of consciousness. Okay? But Schelling actually showed that it's the other subject who has an inner impenetrable density, which makes the other subject actually more material than the inanimate object. Therefore, Kant's thing in itself is not a lifeless object, but is rather the impenetrable other subject. Therefore, there's a type of out of jointness of the subject, which must be considered in light of the way that the ontological condition of the universe is the primordial contraction. Things exist, in other words, because of a catastrophe, which was captured by the primordial contraction. Later, Schelling, therefore, will emphasize ecstasis, being outside itself. There is something of an umbilical cord to a traumatic kernel, which both provides the source of power to the, to the spirit and also um, threatens to swallow it up into the abyss. Therefore, if the subject represents itself in sublated ideality, it has to rely on the contracted element, which eludes idealization. And that will conclude the analysis of chapter one. Let me check for chat. Okay, it looks like no comments. All right, so let's continue with chapter two in the next video. And uh, guys, thanks for watching.